All right, good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here so early. Today's uh, subject is uh, linear models. <clears throat> we saw them already a little bit in the first lecture. Uh, today we're going to look at them in detail, how they work, how we define them, and then how we search for a good linear model to fit our data. That's the topic for today. We're going to start with regression, because that's the easiest one. So I'll explain most of it in the context of regression. Um, and we'll start by just define, uh, explaining how we define a model, define a linear model in a regression setting, what the notation is, and slowly walk through the mathematics of it. Um, then given that definition, we will discuss how to search that particular space of models. <clears throat> and this is really the most important part of the lecture in the sense that this search methods that we will explain today, in particular a search method called gradient descent, um, is basically the backbone of all the, almost all the machine learning we're going to be doing in the whole course. So pay attention. Um, that's not actually the first half. In the first half we will sort of discuss some simple search methods that build up to gradient descent. And then after the break, we will go into some proper calculus and describe, <clears throat> describe actual gradient descent. And then we will finish up by explaining how all of this works for classification, which requires some subtle technical points to be explained. So we'll start, which is why we start with uh, regression. Uh, so just a little recap, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is hard to read. Do I have another color to write with? Is that better? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll leave this on the board. It's just an overview anyway. I'll, um, uh, but, uh, for next time, I'll remember to use the green one. Um, so a little recap from last time. <clears throat> we talked about this basic recipe of uh, machine learning where you take this problem that you have, this generic use case, you abstract it to a standard task like regression or classification mostly. Uh, you choose your examples, the things that you want your machine learning model to learn from. Uh, these are called your instances, and for every instance you measure a number of features so that your whole data set look like, looks like this table. Then you choose a model class, which gives you a whole space of models that you can fit to that data, and then you have to search that space for a good model that fits your data well. So for a regression that looks like this, we have a, a data set. Uh, we feed the data, uh, the data set gives us these instances, which are the rows in the table, for each instance, we have some features measured, which are the columns, and we have a target column here, which in this case is a column of numbers because we're doing regression, so we want to predict numbers for each instance. We feed that whole data set to a learner, which gives us a model, and the model hopefully gives us good predictions for unseen instances. And if we have just one feature, we can visualize it like this, <coughs> where uh, the uh, horizontal axis is our feature space and the vertical axis is our output space. And a linear model just looks like a line drawn here, a linear function that gives us these predictions. So that's what we discussed last week. Uh, we'll simplify things a little bit with a slightly simpler data set with just six points. Uh, and we'll start with the one feature case. So we have just one feature for, our, uh, uh, for every instance. And we'll keep it abstract, so we'll just call that x. And it just happens to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in this case. And then we have some target label that we want to predict, which looks like this. So we want to fit a linear model to these points, which shouldn't be too difficult. They're quite linear already. But just to set up the notation, this is a, a good example. Um, for this lecture, we will use this notation. So capital X is our whole data set our whole set of uh, features, <clears throat> and capital T is our whole set of labels. We'll use superscripts in this case 
to iterate over the um, instances. That's just for this lecture. In future lectures, I might switch to subscript. In this lecture, it's good to keep separate the index over the instances and the index over the features. So for this lecture, we'll use superscripts. Uh, and for each instance, there is one corresponding label. So on this simple data set with just one feature, we want to define a linear model. Um, and if you remember your high school math, this is what a linear function looks like. So you take the input, which is x, you multiply it by some number, and you add some under, other number. And that's enough. These two numbers, w and b, stands for weight and bias. Not very intuitive names, but that's just what, they, um, what we call them. These two numbers are enough to define any line. And the way they do that is w, which is also called the slope, tells us how fast the line increases if we take one step to the right. So if we go plus one to the right, we go w up. That's called the slope. It tells us how angled the line is. And then b tells us how high up the line is at the origin. So if w is zero, or sorry, if x is zero, w times x is zero, then the value of our function is how high up the line is at the origin. So it's sort of basic high school math. Um, for two features, we follow a very simple, uh, very similar uh, idea. We just multiply a coefficient w by the uh, input. In this case, we have two inputs, so we have two coefficients w, each multiplied by the respective feature, and then we add still one bias term to translate the whole thing up and down. So that's what that looks like. This is my best uh, ability to, to draw in in three dimensions using Keynote. So basically, we have this one coefficient, two coefficient, and the bias. Each of these tells us how much the uh, hyperplane, because now we're defining a plane, how much the hyperplane increases if we take a step of one in a particular direction. So if we take a step of one in the direction of the uh, x2 axis, then the plane increases the height of the plane increases by w2. And if we take a step of 1 in the direction of the x1 axis, then the height of the plane incre increases by w1. And in this case, w1 is negative, so the plane actually decreases. And together, this uh, defines the angle of this plane in space. And the bias term, again, is our way of pushing the whole plane up or down. So that's how it looks in two dimensions. In more dimensions, because uh, as I said in the previous lecture, for these regression algorithms and these classification algorithms, we need to be able to do this for an arbitrary number of features. Uh, so then it's easier to say that our instance is a vector. For those of you who have never seen a vector before, just a bunch of numbers arranged in a, a row or a column, in this case a column. Every feature is one of these numbers. So instance xj as features x1 through xm. And the data set is now, data set x is now a series of vectors. So note that the x's are now boldface, indicating that they're vectors. The targets are still numbers. Uh, and this allows us uh, to write the uh, equation for the hyperplane a little bit more efficiently. So this is basically what's happening. We still have a number of features, x1, x2, x3, etc. And one corresponding coefficient for each, w. So if we arrange both the w's and the x's into vectors, then we can just express this linear function as the dot product of these two vectors, plus still a single bias term. So w is a vector. Uh, this should be m. Uh, if I'm consistent with the last slide, but you get the idea. So for every feature, we have one w. So these two vectors are the same length, so we can compute the dot product and add this bias term, and that gives us a hyperplane. So that allows us to do linear regression for any number of features. This function here, which I call the dot product, is very important. It's going to come back a lot, so it's important to get a good intuition for it. Um, so as you could see in the previous slide, it's just a way of combining two uh, Features, you can write it either with like this or like this. 
I like the superscript T notation because it's basically matrix multiplication. You're taking a uh, column vector and you're multiplying it by a row vector, which is the transpose of W. So if you multiply these, what you get is all the elements of W and T multiplied by their, uh, every element of W multiplied by its corresponding element of X, and these all sum together. That's just a dot product, so it's a very simple function, but it's very useful. Um, there's a, a quite magical correspondence, which I uh, don't have time to explain, but it's good to know about. Hopefully you have learned this in linear algebra, or you will learn this if you're concurrently taking linear algebra. Basically what this says is that the dot product, which we can compute like this, we can also compute like this. So if we imagine our vectors as arrows, then it's the length of the W arrow times the length of the X arrow multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. So no matter how high dimensional the space between two lines, there is always one angle because two lines together determine one plane and in that plane they have one angle. And this also allows you to uh, compute the dot product. Um, so I won't attempt to give you any intuition for this. You'll just have to take my word for it. This is true. Uh, there is a link in the slides where they do explain this. Uh, to give you some, uh, I would like to give you some intuition for the dot product, for how it works in this setting of, of uh, linear regression. So let's take the ex example of uh, predicting whether or not a patient has high blood pressure. Uh, so it's a typical machine learning example. Uh, patients are our instances and our features are whether they have job stress, whether they have a healthy diet and their age. So these, are, these might be indicators of um, having high blood pressure. So if we fit a linear model to these three uh, features, we get a three-dimensional weight factor. And what you end up doing when you compute this dot product uh, which it, clearly the higher the dot product, the higher we predict the risk of high blood pressure to be. Every um, coefficient in this uh, vector of weights maps to every feature. So this, the first one, which maps to uh, the stress of the job, indicates how important it is for this prediction whether or not a person has a stressful job. What you see with the second one here is that if something is negatively correlated, so a healthy diet contributes negatively to high blood pressure, uh, then the coefficient can become, for, if, for a good model, the coefficient becomes negative. So the bigger this instance, the more negative, uh, the, uh, sorry, if this coefficient is negative, then, the, then a big value here for a healthy diet brings down this dot product. So this, the, the main thing that's happening in a dot product is this sort of sign thing. If the two parts here and here are both positive, then they contribute positively to the uh, dot product. If they're both negative, then the signs cancel out. They also contribute positively to the dot product. If one of them is negative and the other is positive, it contributes negatively to the dot product. And the second is that you get a nice relative magnitude. So if um, stress is predictive, but not that important, then this term will not be very big. And if diet is much more important, then this second term will be much bigger than this uh, first term. So that's sort of how the, the dot product operates. And that's how we define a linear function uh, over uh, an n-dimensional feature space. So then the question is, given this function, given this way of defining our functions, which uh, should we pick? What should be the value of this W vector? And what should be the value of the bias term? So we saw this, uh, the basic principle in the last lecture already. We define a loss function, which tells us how good a particular model is doing. And then we search for the model that minimizes the loss function. So here's the one we discussed uh, last week, which we're going to use, uh, sorry, last uh, lecture, which we're going to use today as well. It's called the mean squared error loss. So we take these, uh, this is our function, this line, and we have these little 
sticks here that tell us how far the prediction of our model is from what we know to be true. These are called the residuals. And what we do is we, sum, we square these residuals and we sum them all up. So that's what this says. The green bit is the residual, we square it, and we sum the whole thing up. And here you see our model. FP, that's our model, and P determines which particular model we've chosen. P is the, the set of parameters. So if you fill in our actual model, here we see that our parameters are W and B, so these are the arguments of the loss function. And this becomes our residual WTX plus B minus Y. So the output of our model minus the uh, target value that we know to be true. Uh, this is our loss, this is what we're going, this function is what we're going to try to minimize. Uh, as we said last week, there's one, there are two reasons for the squaring. One is that if we sum up all these residuals, we don't want them, we don't want two big residuals to cancel out if one of them happens to be positive and the other happens to be negative. So we have here on the left a big uh, residual and here on the right, a big residual, if we just summed up the residuals without squaring them, these two might cancel out. And even though we have big errors, we would get a low loss, which is not what we want. Um, you could also fix that by taking the absolute value. But another nice thing about the <coughs> square is that it penalizes outliers disproportionately. So what you see here, this is a visualization of the square. So if you look at the surface areas of these squares, literally squares, that's how much every error in our data set contributes to the loss. So what you see is that even though if you look at these two ones on the left here, even though the far left one is twice as big, the residual is twice as big as the one to the right of it, the actual contribution to the loss is four times as big because it's a big outlier. So this sort of gives the outliers much more strength to pull on this line than all the other, fun than all the other data points. Um, which is not necessarily a good thing, it's a choice. This is a choice you make in choosing your loss function. There are other loss functions, this just happens to be one of them. Uh, yeah, so the question is, how about what if you don't want to make that choice? If you don't want to penalize the outliers, you could use absolute loss. So instead of squaring it, you just remove the sign. Just make all of them positive. Uh, you could even use logarithmic loss then you get the opposite effect. So then the small uh, ones proportionately uh, count much higher. That's just a choice. Depends on your domain, which one is uh, most suitable. For now, we'll stick with the squared error loss because it's sort of historically the most important one. Um, there are a few slight variations. The, in the previous slide, I gave you the mean of all the squared residuals which is the second line here. Uh, you don't really need to divide by n. You can also just take the sum. Sometimes you put a half in front so that when you start doing the calculus and taking the derivatives, things work out nicer. Sometimes you take the square of it, which is called the root mean squared error. Basically, the message here is these differences don't really matter because we're not interested in the absolute value of the loss. We don't really care what the actual loss is. We just care which of two models has the higher loss. And since n stays the same, it doesn't really matter whether you take the mean or the sum. The relative uh, value of the loss is always going to stay the same. So you might see all of these variations popping up throughout the course, depending on what, uh, what is most helpful in the current context. Uh, but they don't, they don't really matter, these, uh, these variations. Uh, how are we doing for time? Well, I'll have to hurry it up a little bit. Um, so let's search for a good model <clears throat> that gives us a low loss. So we had this uh, feature space here. This is the purple bit, which is where all our data points live. And then there's a bunch of models which we can draw, like either the green model or the red model. And as we saw in the last lecture, we also have a model space, because every model is defined by a value w and a value b, uh, which are the parameters of the model. So a point in this space corresponds to a model on this feature space. So the green point corresponds to the green line, and the red point corresponds to the red line. 
And now that we know our loss, now that we have a loss, we can color every point in our model space by the loss of that particular model, how well that particular model does. So we'll color it bright if the model does well, if the loss is low, with uh, white as a sort of minimum value, and we'll color it uh, darker and darker as the loss get worse, gets worse and worse. So for our data set, that looks like this. Here's our W and here's our B. And if we pick our model here on the bottom left, we have a terrible model, so it's very black. And somewhere around here is our best model with the lowest loss. Um, two things to remember. Firstly, this is specific to our data set. If the data set changes, then the optimal model changes, obviously. <coughs> Secondly, looking at this, you might think, well, that's easy. I know where the best model is. It's over there, where the bright bit is. But obviously, normally, this is an, a high-dimensional space. You have many more data points, many more features. I mean, you have many more features. So this is a high-dimensional space, so you cannot really look at the whole space in one go. You can only look at one point at a time. So that makes it more difficult, but this visualization should hopefully help you to understand what's going on. Uh, and this general idea of finding the lowest point of a particular function is called optimization in mathematics. Uh, and we describe it like this. So it's an argmin, which basically says, take this function, find the minimum value of this function for all values. Uh, Look at all values of the arc of this thing below the argmin, the p. Look at all values of p, and find the p that minimizes this thing to the right of the argmin. So we want to find the p that minim minimizes the loss function. And in our example, p is a bunch of numbers uh, describing our linear model, which can be a set or a vector. Sort of depends on exactly how you're searching. So let's start with our first search algorithm, which is called, oh, we're, let's actually keep track of things. So we've talked about how to define regression, how to define a linear regression model. And we've talked a little bit about what search is and how to define a loss function. So now let's look at our first actual search algorithm, which is very simple. It's called random search. So we start with a random point in the model space, P, just pick one at random. And then we pick a point close to it, which we'll define more precisely later what that means. We pick a point close to it, and we evaluate the loss for both. And if the new point has a lower loss than the old point, we move to the new point. And then we look. So we pick another point close to, the, to that point. We see, did we improve? Then we move to the new point. If we didn't improve, we stay with the old point, and we pick a new random point close to the, that point. And we keep doing that and doing that and doing that until hopefully we converge to a low point. So this is a bit like a hiker in a snowstorm. So imagine you're out on a hike. Uh, you're up a mountain and you're caught in a snowstorm, so you can't see anything. But you know that you're high up in the mountain and you know that your hotel is down in the valley. So you need to get down to the valley, like our search method. One thing you can do is sort of feel around where the locally the uh, slope of the mountain goes down, and if you feel, okay, in this direction it goes down, you take a step in that direction, and then you feel around again, you go, oh, now I'm going in that direction, and step by step, even though you can't see a thing, you will hopefully gradually get down to lower ground where the snowstorm isn't so bad, and then you can find your hotel. So that's sort of what our model is doing. Specifically, our model cannot see any further than the current point. It has this blindness that we, uh, uh, for which the snowstorm is a metaphor. Uh, we haven't defined what close to means. You can define that in different ways. Simplest way is just to say uh, fixed distance. So we look at all the points that are a fixed distance from our current point, and we pick a random one. And if it's worse, like in this case, we discard it, and we pick another random one. And if that one is better, then we move to that point, and then we pick a random point out of all the points that are fixed distance again. 
So if you keep doing that on our loss uh, on our um, uh, loss curve, our loss loss surface, it uh, looks like this. So this is our random point where we start. These are a couple of false starts on the left here, and step by step you see that it sort of slowly goes into this valley where the uh, good models are. And if we plot this in model space, then every point here becomes a line. Sorry, if we plot this in feature space, this is model space. If we plot it in feature space, and every one of these red points is a line. Oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Uh, it's a good question. So the question is, is there a, a limit for how far you can take a step? There is in this first example that we're doing now. For this, we just say uh, we take a step of a fixed size, uh, which we just choose, so 0 0.01 or something. So we choose randomly from all the models on this circle. So it's literally like going like this with a fixed step size. We can only, uh, every step we take is in the, is the same length. We'll look at some variations later. Uh, so this is what it looks like in feature space. Uh, the, uh, this is the start, the, lo the um, lightest colored line is the starting point, and you see that it slowly more or less sort of converges to a, a reasonable fit. Um, so that's our first search method called random search, which allows us to talk about some uh, relevant concepts. The first is convexity. So con uh, convexity basically is the property of having one minimum. So if this is our loss, for loss surface over a model space in one dimension in this case, to make it simple, then uh, the loss surface, we say that the loss surface is convex if for any two points, whatever two points we pick, the line drawn between those two points is always everywhere above the loss surface. So if this line is always, no matter where we pick the blue points, entirely above the loss surface, then the loss surface is convex, which implies that there is a single optimum, a single lowest point, which we call the global minimum, which is a nice property to have for various reasons. It's not a property that we always have. It depends on the model. If we don't have a convex loss surface, then we might have local and global minima. So here we see a non-convex loss surface, because if you draw a line between this little ball here and this little ball here, then the line intersects the loss surface, so that line would not be above the loss surface everywhere. And this loss surface has one global minimum, which is the lowest point out of the whole uh, space, out of the whole model space. This is the lowest possible point. But it also has two local minima, which are points that are, uh, you can get lower. If you go to the red point, it's lower than these purple points. But locally, within their neighborhood, the purple points are the lowest point. So they're local minima. And sometimes, it depends on the case, but sometimes you don't want to get stuck in the local minimum. You want to find the global minimum. And then random search, as we've described it now, uh, is a problem because once it gets stuck in this local minimum up here, this uh, in the bottom is the global minimum. If it gets stuck in the local minimum here, uh, then it just sort of jumps around. It never jumps out because if it finds a step that gets it to a lower size, it always moves downhill. It never moves uphill, so it never gets out of this global minimum and into the local uh, out of this local minimum and into the global minimum. So we can look at our first uh, addition to a random search, which we'll call simulated annealing, which is called simulated annealing. So it's a little addition, so we st stick with the basic principle of random search. We pick a new random point close to the old point. If it's lower, then we move to the new point. If the new point isn't lower, then with some small probability Q, which we have to come up with, let's say at uh, 10%, we still move to the new point. Even though it's worse than the old point, we still move to the new point with a 10% probability. So with some small probability, we can move uphill. 
uh, yeah, so the question is, couldn't we just pick another starting point? So for instance, if you find you get stick, stuck, you can just reset. That's also a possibility. This is just another way of doing it. And these are all useful model, uh, useful ways of searching. So here's what simulated annealing looks like. It still gets stuck, uh, hits the local minimum. But as you can see, it moves around a lot more. And eventually, by pure chance, it makes its way to the global minimum. And if you wait long enough, it will also jump back out of the global minimum. So with simulated annealing, you do need, if you want the absolute global minimum, you do need to remember the best point you've seen. But that's fine. That doesn't take very much memory. Uh, so simulated annealing works like this. Uh, I should say that in many uh, situations, you don't actually want to find the absolute global minimum. So if you remember, for instance, the um, uh, regression tree from the first lecture that perfectly hit all the points, that sort of finds a minimum that is slightly too good because it overfits. So in some cases, if your model is so complex that it can overfit, you're actually not, not looking for the global minimum. You're looking for some local minimum that generalizes well. So this is sort of depends on your situation, how much you want to avoid these local minima and how much you want to jump out of them. But in general, you want some ability to jump out of local minima. Uh, there's a few variations to mention. So that we uh, did this fixed radius one first. You could also, to pick your next point, sample randomly within the circle. So you take a maximum step size, but you also allow smaller steps. Or a very good option is a normal distribution, where something like 60% of your steps will be inside the circle, but you also allow steps of any size. Oh, uh, yeah, so there's a question, when does the search know how to stop? Uh, that entirely depends on you as a practitioner. So in a lot of cases, you just say, well, my patience is limited. I have eight hours of patience, so I let it run for eight hours. Uh, that's good for the simulated annealing, especially. If you have something like this, you can say, well, I haven't moved any, I haven't made any progress in the last 1,000 iterations. I'll assume I've stopped. I'll assume this is the best I'm going to do. So it entirely depends on, on the situation. Uh, there's a bunch of, of fairly intuitive stop criteria. Yes, yeah, so with random search, with both random search and uh, simulated annealing, there is a probability if you stop too early that you will not find the global minimum, which is, uh, yeah, it's search, so it's ad hoc, so it's the best effort kind of thing. Yes, so the um, question is, uh, wouldn't it make more sense to try a few directions? So we're moving, uh, yeah, uh, wait 10 slides and we'll get to that. Uh, so you can take a normal distribution, which is uh, helpful because then you, uh, most of your step sizes will be in the circle, but technically you allow with smaller and smaller probability, larger and larger step sizes. Uh, so even then, even with random search, you have some probability of, of ending up anywhere in the model space. So here's uh, what it looks like with random uh, uh, random search, uh, sorry, uh, with a normal distribution, normally distributed step sizes. So you see lots of different sizes of steps here. Uh, by and large, there's lots of variations, but mostly we're discussing random search as a stepping stone to gradient descent. So don't, uh, uh, let's not spend too much time on this. Um, if you have a discrete model space, like these three models that we saw, then the space of all your models is not a plane or a cube or a Euclidean space, it's a discrete space. Uh, so it looks like a kind of graph in this case. Uh, you can still do random search, but you need to figure out a transition function, a step that will take you from one model to another model. So in this case, I've connected all trees that are 
uh, where you can get from one tree to another by deleting a node or adding a node. Uh, and that's these gray uh, circles. So these gray circles are now the model space. And if you randomly walk over these gray circles, you do a random search over your discrete model space. So that's also possible. <clears throat> uh, so all of these functions come under the header of black box optim optimization. Because we don't really need to know what the model does, how it works, we don't have to have any insight into the model. All we need to do is to be able to evaluate the model to compute the loss. And so long as we can do that, we can apply random search or simulated annealing. Uh, you can also do this in parallel. So if you're worried about not finding a good uh, global optimum, you can just do random search and do a couple of restarts, either run a couple of searches at the same time, or as we discussed earlier, wait until you get stuck and then reset at another point. So that's in parallel. Um, you can also uh, do this in parallel, but allow slight amounts of communication between the uh, methods searching in parallel. So you let these search independently for a while and then allow a little bit of communication, allow them to talk to each other one way or another, which leads to uh, population methods. Most of these, so you have a population of, uh, let's say, agents searching this model space. It's like a group of hikers in a snowstorm. Um, and most of these population methods are inspired by uh, biology. So you have evolutionary algorithms, particle swarms and colonies, that sort of thing. Uh, let's look at evolution strategies, which is probably the most popular one. Evolutionary algorithms, sorry, which is probably the most popular one. Which is many, many variations, but we'll look at a very simple example. Uh, so we start, instead of with one random point in the model space, we start with a population of k models. And we rank all of them by loss. And then we kill <coughs> the ones that do the worst. We throw them away. And from the ones that remain, we breed a new population of models. And by you have to instantiate this yourself. You have to figure out what breeding means in this context. But usually it's something like you pick two random parents from this uh, surviving population and you combine them somehow to make a child. And that's your new population. You do that until your po new population is the size of the old population. Uh, and optionally, you can add a little noise to each child that's called mutation that uh, can also ha help a lot. So here's what that looks like in our uh, model. So here we have a whole population and I've colored the worst 50% red and the best 50% green. So we kill the worst 50% and then we breed among the best 50% by drawing a line between them and picking a point halfway on that line, which is a good way, as, a good way, as good a way of creating mixtures as any. So then we get a new population of children, which as you can see is a lot closer to the good area of the model space. And again, we kill the worst half, the uh, red points, we keep the best half, the green points, and we keep doing this. And step by step, you see that we hone in on two of the local minima, and slowly we go to the global minimum. If you keep going and going and going, you end up with a population entirely in the global minimum. Uh, so these are very, very powerful methods. They're still black box, so you still don't really need to know anything about your model. They're very easy to parallelize because you basically have a bunch of um, searches running in parallel, only occasionally communicating. Uh, but they can be very expensive because you need to evaluate your loss function. If your loss function is expensive to evaluate, you need to evaluate it every time, every time step for every uh, element in your population. So that makes it more expensive. And it can be difficult to tune because there's a lot of arbitrary choices compared to random search. Uh, and there's a lot of variations of these evolutionary methods. But nevertheless, if you can afford it, it's very powerful to, to do. Uh, so that's a bun bunch of black box uh, search methods. As a, there's one left, which is a sort of stepping stone to gradient descent, which we'll talk, uh, talk about after the break. It doesn't have a, a name that I could find, uh, so I've called it brand, branching search, and it's basically what, what uh, I forget who said it, but 
uh, the commenter earlier said, what if instead of picking one random point, you do literally what the hiker in a snowstorm did, you pick a few points randomly. And then you figure, okay, that one was the lowest, so then I move to that one, and then you pick a few points again. So that's what happens here in line uh, four, one, two, line three. Uh, you pick k random points, and then you min take the minimum of those points and you move in that direction. So you give yourself a couple more samples for every iteration to uh, look at the loss surface. So if you have k2, then it looks exactly the, more or less exactly the same as um, plain random search, because you're not taking a lot of extra samples. If you have k5, you can see that it's moving a lot more directly to the uh, minimum. And for k15, you can see that, especially in the first steps, it's really heading straight for where the lower, uh, the lower uh, part of the loss function is, loss landscape is. Um, so that gives us the following principles that we uh, can apply to sort of help us choose our loss function, help us figure out what kind of loss function is most helpful. If we want to escape local minima, <clears throat> we should add some randomness because that helps, or we should try multiple models in parallel like in evolutionary methods or parallel search. And if we want to converge faster, <clears throat> uh, we can do breeding, like combine our currently best models and uh, combine them in different ways, like evolutionary methods do. Or we can spend more compute computational power figuring out what the local neighborhood looks like, inspecting the local neighborhood a little bit more before we decide in which direction to take our step. Which brings us to gradient descent, because if we know some calculus, then actually we don't need to do all this sampling. We can actually look at the function, give up this black boxness, look at the function and let the function itself tell us in which direction the loss surface decreases the quickest. And that's what we'll talk about after the break. So let's take 50 minutes and return with gradient descent. All right, find your seat. Let's get started again with gradient descent. <clears throat> uh, oh yeah, one interesting question I got uh, during the break is um, basically if this gradient descent with this calculus is so brilliant and um, it allows you to basically if, it, uh, if using gradient descent makes all these random search methods that we talked about in the first half superfluous, then what was the point of spending 45 minutes on them? Which is that uh, you cannot always apply gradient descent. It requires a lot of calculus and it requires a lot of insight into your model, which you don't always have. For instance, if you're playing games, you cannot take the derivative of a game engine. Well, not always, anyway. Um, so in those cases, all these random search methods, evolutionary search, met search methods, are all you have. But in some cases, you can take the derivative of your model. And in those cases, gradient descent is usually a better option. All right, so uh, basic outline. We're going to go uh, deep into the math, uh, math, math mathematics. So um, <clears throat> just to sort of keep a high level overview of, of what we're doing at all times, this is the basic principle. We're going to use calculus, and using calculus, by which I mean just taking the derivative, the afgeleide in Dutch, using calculus we can find the direction in which a function goes down most quickly, and also how quickly it goes down in that direction. That direction is the opposite of a direction called the gradient. In other words, the gradient is something that points in the direction a, a function grows most quickly. And gradient descent is just figuring out the gradient and taking a small step in the opposite direction and then doing that again and again and again. So it's like random search without the random sampling. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to fill in the blanks in this story. So calculus for most of you will be a, a long time ago. Hopefully. Hopefully you've done at least some calculus. Um, so we'll review uh, some of the basics. So we've talked a lot about linear functions. A linear function in one dimension consists of these two numbers. 
the number that tells us how quickly the function uh, increases or decreases if it's negative if we take one step to the right that number is called the slope so here we have a green function with a negative slope a slope of minus one and here we have a red function with a positive slope, a slope of one half. It's just what we call it. If we, don't, if we have a function that isn't linear, but we're only interested in how it behaves at a particular point, let's call that point P, what we can do is find a tangent line. Basically, we figure out the one line that just touches the function at one point. <clears throat> and if the function is smooth, that tangent line always exists. And then we can think about what is the function, uh, what is the, what are the, the, the parameters, how do we describe this function, this uh, line. So let's call it gx. That's a linear function, so it has a slope. And some bias term that we're not interested in, we don't really care how high up it is. We're interested in the slope, and that slope is the gradient. Uh, sorry, is the derivative of the function at p. So if we take the derivative of the function f, which is another function, we evaluate that derivative at point p. That gives us the slope of the tangent line at point p. So that's basic one-dimensional cal calculus. And in our case, obviously, this function is the loss surface and the space over which it's defined is our model space. So we're going to look through this model space for the point where this function f is the lowest. <coughs> to translate this to higher dimensions, uh, the, and end up with the gradient, which is sort of the higher dimensional analog of the derivative, uh, the tangent line, the first step, the tangent line becomes a tangent hyperplane. So if you're interested in this point here, call that point P, we want to uh, approximate linearly how the point behaves, uh, how the function, this ball, behaves in that region. Uh, then instead of fitting uh, a line that just touches the function, we take a plane or a hyperplane in higher dimensions and uh, the principle otherwise is the same. So we fit a linear function that just touches the function that we're interested in. And locally, that's the best linear approximation of the function. Um, so we're interested in that hyperplane. Uh, one more uh, bit of uh, preliminary. So we've talked about vectors as uh, just a list of numbers and vectors representing points in space. So this ve vector 3, 1 represents this point in space. Uh, we can also think of vectors as a direction. So this particular vector represents this direction in space. It's slightly more than a direction, it's a direction with a magnitude. Uh, so it's this direction and the magnitude is expressed as this formula, which uh, yeah, that's just how it's, uh, how it's calculated. So remember, when we're describing linear functions, in this case we're not describing our model as a linear function, we are describing an approximation to the loss surface as a linear function. But the principle is the same. If we do that in multiple dimensions, we get one coefficient for every axis in our space. And those coefficients together give us the angle, the angles of this, uh, this hyperplane that just touches uh, our, loss curve, uh, our loss surface. So when we take the gradient, when we figure out, when we want to figure out what the orientation of this hyperplane is, uh, we're actually working out these slopes. So instead of working out one slope, we work out all the slopes in all the directions. Which is basically we do by taking the derivative in all directions. So if f is our function, then upside down triangle f is our gradient, 
also called Nabla, this symbol, which is the high dimensional analog of the derivative. And it's basically a vector that takes the partial derivative in the x direction and the partial derivative in the y direction. If you have a two dimensional function, you have two axes, you take the derivative in that direction and the derivative in that direction. That's called a partial derivative. Basically what you do is you take the derivative with respect to y and you treat, the, oh sorry, with respect to x for the first one, and you treat y as a constant. So you treat y as uh, you would normally do when you see a number or uh, some constant. And you do that for x and for y, so you get two derivatives. You put those into a vector, and that's your, uh, that, that's, those are the coefficients of your hyperplane. So the derivative with respect to x, evaluated at p, becomes the coefficient for x for this hyperplane, and the derivative uh, with respect to y, evaluated at p, becomes coefficient for y. Then this in two dimensions, if we write it in higher dimensions, then we compute this gradient, evaluate it, which is a function, a function outputting a vector, we evaluate it at point P, and that gives us the coefficients for the best hyperplane approximation to our function at point P. Uh, yeah, is the, out, the question is, is the output a function, uh, no, so the output of, uh, let me say it properly, when you take the gradient, uh, every, this is this here uh, at the top, uh, I've written it as a vector, but here every element is a function, so the result of taking the derivative of f over x is a function, uh, so you get a sort of function in every direction, and if you evaluate those functions, then you can gather up the results into a vector. That's probably the best way to think about it. Uh, so only if you evaluate the gradient at f do you get these coefficients. Uh, at b, sorry, do you get these coefficients. But basically, when we say the gradient is, we usually talk about either the vector for a particular point, while well, we sort of yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of not that precise when we talk about the gradients. It's either this collection of derivatives or the collection of derivatives as evaluated at a particular point. Um, anyway, so now we have a way to figure out, and we'll show a look at an example later, but we have a way to figure out what this hyperplane is, what the function is that describes this hyperplane. So now we only need to look at this hyperplane to figure out in which direction does it go up the quickest or down the quickest, which is sort of, if it goes up the quickest in that direction, it's a plane, so then it goes down the quickest in the opposite direction. Uh, so let's look at, for a given linear function, what is the direction of steepest descent? The first thing we can do is forget about this uh, bias term, this uh, plus c here, because if we translate the whole thing up or down, that doesn't matter, it doesn't change the angle of steepest descent, steepest ascent. So we can throw that away and just start with this uh, WTX, set the bias to zero. The second thing we can do is uh, to figure out the direction. We can start at the origin, so start where X is all zeros, and take a step of a fixed size. So we take a step of size one, because we're only interested in the direction. Uh, so we look at all vectors of size one all possible x's of size one, of norm one, figure out which one gives us the, uh, which one causes the function g to increase the most. And for this it helps to take the other expression of the dot product. So we rewrite the dot product from this wtx thing into these two norms in the cosine of alpha. We're taking a step of one, so we can set the norm of x to one, which leaves us with the norm of w, times the cosine of alpha. Um, so it looks like x has disappeared, but actually x is still, our choice of x is still determining this alpha. Uh, 
So the question is, because you know, if we change the orientation of x, then this alpha changes. So the question is, which direction of x maximizes this value? W is fixed, that's a constant, so we can forget about that as well. And basically the cosine of alpha is maximal when alpha is zero. Cosine is one when alpha is zero, which means that they're the same. So lots of weird math, but basically this function is maximized when the green arrow is the same as the orange arrow. Which is to say that if you have a description of a linear function like this, then W is actually the direction of steepest descent. In other words, the gradient is the direction of steepest descent. That's all we've proved. So if you didn't quite follow this, don't worry, just remember that the gradient is the direction of steepest descent. Which means that if we want to go down, we move in the opposite direction. So we put a minus in front of the gradient and we move in that direction. Which finally brings us to the gradient descent algorithm, so lots of explanations. But it's all worth it because we now end up with a two-line algorithm. We start with a, if we forget about the initialization, we start with a random point in the plane again, as usual. We don't even evaluate the loss function. We never evaluate the loss function. We just compute the gradient of the loss function at P, which gives us the gradient, which gives us the direction of steepest descent. We multiply that by some small value called eta to control because it's a local approximation. <clears throat> so if we take too big a step, then the difference between this tangent hyperplane and our actual function becomes too big. So we want a small step size so that this approximation is still uh, worthwhile. So we multiply the gradient by step size eta. We put a minus in front of it because we want to move in the opposite direction so that we're moving down and we subtract that from p, and that becomes our new p. And then we do that again and again and again and again, either until we are out of patience or until p stops changing, uh, or until the gradient becomes zero, because if you remember your calculus, if the derivative is zero, then you're at an optimum. Lots of ways to determine the stop condition. But the basic idea is you just loop and loop and loop for as long as you usually can. And that gives you a gradient descent. So this is what we were trying to do. We use calculus to inspect the function. The gradient gives us the direction of steepest descent, and we take steps in the opposite direction. So let's put that into practice. <coughs> Give you a little break to digest because there's some mathematics coming up. So this is our uh, our loss function. Remember for a simple data set of these six points, and we have two parameters for our model, w and b. Uh, and this was our loss function, the mean squared error. So what we want now is to figure out the gradient for this function. And the gradient is just two functions, the derivative with respect to w and the derivative with respect to b. So we'll do uh, with respect to B first. So it's just, we put these uh, Ds in front of it to take the partial derivative. And the first rule we use is that the derivative, uh, so this just, by the way, just to, now it's a one-dimensional derivative. So here it's, it's complicated multidimensional stuff, but we just take a partial derivative with respect to W. So this is just, a, the notation is maybe a little bit weird, but this is just what you should know from high school already. Uh, so the first rule we use is that, um, for two rules we use is that if there's a constant in your derivative, like 1 over n, you can move it out of the derivative. Second rule is that if your derivative is a sum of a bunch of things, uh, the derivative is the sum of the derivatives of the individual terms. So we move the sum and the constant out of the derivative. So it's the constant rule and the sum rule. And this will, you can, plenty of time to practice all of this in the homework exercises. Uh, so now we have a much simpler derivative. So we have this square to deal with. So we use something called the chain rule, which is uh, an important rule. 
which is basically if you have a, a composition of two functions, you can take the derivative. Uh, well, maybe that's maybe not the most intuitive way to explain it. Let's let me show you first. So we take the derivative of the square with respect to whatever its argument is. So this function here with respect to whatever's inside the square, and we multiply it by that thing, the argument of the square, and take the derivative with that uh, with respect to the thing where we're taking the derivative uh, to the w. So that's called the chain rule. So we sort of take this function and build it into this chain of derivatives. So now this thing on the left here, this looks complicated, but it's just a square. It's just a derivative of a square, because this is all the argument. Uh, and the derivative of a square is um, as you know if you have some x squared take the derivative with respect to x where here x is just that w x i plus b minus y uh, the derivative is 2 times x because the exponent goes in front and you subtract one. So the two here has gone out in front and we move it out in front to the, uh, to the sum. Uh, so we're left with just two and then the, uh, the thing inside the square. And on the right side, we can see that we have three terms and only one of them has W in it. So the terms that don't have w in it disappear. And this is just some constant times w. So we can remove the w and we just end up with the constant. Those sort of basic derivative taking and we end up with this as our first, the first part of our gradient. For the second part, we need to take the derivative with respect to b. All the steps are the same, except when we get to this point here, uh, it's not the first term, but the second term that has b in it. So uh, we take the derivative of this b term with respect to b, which becomes 1. So instead of this xi at the end, we just get a 1 at the end, which sort of disappears. So these are our two derivatives. And now we have a gradient, which we can, we can implement these functions in uh, Python and compute them at every iteration of our gradient descent, which looks like this. So here you can see that it's, uh, it's a lot of hassle, a lot of extra complexity, but it is worth it because instead of jumping around all over the place, the gradient descent really neatly and directly moves through the loss, curve, uh, loss surface and quite directly moves uh, for the brightest point, heads for the brightest point. Here's how it looks in uh, feature space. And you can play around with this yourself with a little website that I highly recommend called playground.tensorflow.org. If you go to this URL directly, it will look very complicated. But if you go to the link that's in the slide annotations, oh, uh, you'll see a slightly stripped down version because I've turned off some of the features. Uh, and what this app does is it basically gives you a linear regression. So we have two uh, feature inputs here, x1 and x2. And we have some data. And it's regression data, so the points are uh, numbers. Blue are high numbers, orange are low numbers. Uh, the model is randomly initialized, so it's actually initialized to quite a good model. Let's set it to reinitialize a few times so that it becomes a bad model. So here top right we have the high numbers, bottom low we have the uh, low numbers. They have a linear relation, so we can fit a plane through this. Uh, let's set the learning rate slightly lower. Oh, where's my cursor? There we go. So that we can see what's happening. And as you see, it slowly 
fits the plane to the data. We can add a little noise so that it's not quite linear, the data resets automatically. And you see that even if you add a little noise, it still fits a nice plane through it. But if you switch to different data, which isn't linear at all, you see here is that it has blue patches and orange patches and blue patches and or orange patches mixed uh, with each other. Then there is no good plane to fit through it. And even gradient descent doesn't really know what to do. And it's sort of it's difficult to see, but this is basically a flat plane that it's fitting through everything to sort of uh, spread its losses. So there's one thing you can play around with and we'll keep coming back to this playground of TensorFlow and adding different features to it as the course progresses to illustrate various points. Um, what else? Yeah, um, gradient descent is very nice and very good, but it doesn't help you deal with local minima. As you can see, problems really even worse. It, it really sticks, once it finds a minimum, it really sticks with the minimum. Uh, so you might need to restart a few times to find if you uh, want global minima to find the global minimum. It's slightly off the actual minimum here, but that's probably due to some rounding errors. It's a complicated derivative, this function. Um, a more important point is that you have to set this learning rate very carefully. What you see in the top left here is that if you set the learning rate too high, then despite the fact that we know exactly in which direction to move, we take too big a step and it's like if you're in this ball, you're sort of jumping from one side of the ball to another and you're zigzagging towards the middle. If you set the learning rate too slow, too low, you don't have this problem, but it might take ages and ages and ages for you to converge. So tuning this learning rate is a big point, a big, big part of modern machine learning. We spend a lot of time on this sort of thing. So that's gradient descent. Uh, search was done already. Gradient descent. Uh, some drawbacks, it only works for continuous model spaces where we can find the derivative, uh, where we have a smooth loss function for which we can work out the derivative, the gradient. So those are a lot of ifs. And it doesn't escape local minima. But if we can deal with all of this, if none of these are problems, then we do have a very fast, low memory way of very accurately and very quickly finding a minimum. And gradient descent is basically what 99% of machine learning does or tries to approximate. Uh, modern machine learning, I should say. It's uh, recently researched in popularity. Um, I should also mention that actually when you're doing uh, linear regression, you don't actually use gradient descent normally because linear regression is such a simple, simple model that you can actually work out these derivatives, set them equal to zero and solve them. So you can actually solve these, this system of equations for W and B and work out what the optimum is without ever searching at all. I don't go into that because that only works for gradient descent. Basically, if you go even slightly more, um, sorry, that only works for linear models. If you go even slightly more complicated, uh, well, you can still set it equal to zero, but you can't solve anymore and you need to search. So basically, in most practical machine learning settings, we need to search. But just remember, you don't actually need to search if your model is linear. So that's uh, regression. Finally, it's worth having a look at how all of this works in the classification setting, if we want to do classification. Because in classification, we also have this uh, linear model, if you remember, a model defined as a line. Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated, but not that more, much more complicated. <clears throat> so let's first, we'll uh, take the same pattern. We'll uh, start by setting up our definitions. How do we, if we want to do this kind of classification, 
on a feature space, how do we define this model? How do we define this line? It's very similar, but not quite the same. Uh, the most straightforward way of doing it is taking this form of a linear function, wtx plus b, uh, fitting it on the entire feature space. So you can sort of imagine a third dimension poking out through the slide. Uh, and this function evaluates, uh, gives you the value of that third dimension. The bigger this wtx plus b is, the higher that function is. So you get a hyperplane in three dimensions, which cuts through this two-dimensional feature space. So at some points it's higher than zero, and some points it's lower than zero. If it's higher than zero, we call it, uh, we predict the red class. If it's, uh, sorry, I say it the wrong way around. If it's higher than zero, we predict the blue class. If it's lower than zero, we predict the red class. So it looks like this if we have a one-dimensional example. So we have one feature X. We pick a W and we pick a B. We get a line that uh, at some point intersects our uh, feature space. And that point is our decision boundary. Everything to the right we call blue, everything to the left we call red. And in two dimensions, it looks like this. So that's how, that's an easy way to uh, define a linear classifier. And what you see is that this line that actually classifies, that actually becomes our decision boundary, is not the line that we uh, parameterize, but is the intersection of our linear, of our hyperplane, with the feature space. Uh, but practically, we have the same shape of a function as we had with the linear regression. We have some w's, which we dot product with the x's, and we add one single b. And remember that if you have this shape of function, this wtx plus b function, that the direction of steepest descent is w, uh, which we can now actually visualize as the vector perpendicular to the decision boundary. Because the decision boundary is, if we move along the decision boundary, we basically stay at the same height, right? Because these are all the points where the function evaluates to zero. So perpendicular to that is the direction of steepest descent. So that's one more way to think about what this w means in this kind of function. So let's uh, again set up some uh, very simple data to make things easy for ourselves. Um, so we have some basic uh, six points of classification data, some truths and some falses, blue points and red points, and we want to fit the classifier to this. So the next step is to come up with the loss function. Uh, any thoughts? What makes a good classification model? What do we want from a classification model? Very good, a small number of misclassifications. So we can just take whatever model we found, count how many points it misclassifies, and use that as a loss, is option one. This causes a problem. Here's uh, that plotted for our model. Um, our model actually has three parameters, so I've set one of them to one so that we can actually plot it. Principle's the same. Um, what you see here is because we've only we only have six points, uh, as you move through the model space, there's only six possible values because there's only six things you can misclassify. So the loss can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And in between, it just jumps. So all of this region here, this black region in the top right, has the same value. So if you're doing random search on this loss function, uh, you run into a problem because all of the points you evaluate have the same loss. And you sort of 
end up moving randomly, doing a random walk through the space until you happen to hit the gray point, and then you jump to the gray point. So it takes ages. If you're doing gradient descent, you have even worse trouble. Because here in this whole black space, and in every one of these polygons, the gradient is zero. Because the function, the loss function, has the same value, so the gradient is zero everywhere. Except on the edge between two of these polygons, where the gradient is undefined. So your algorithm either doesn't do anything, or it crashes. So even though this is the loss function that we're interested in, so it's our, maybe let's call that our evaluation function, the thing that we actually want to minimize, it's not a loss function that leads to a good search algorithm, because we don't get a smooth loss function. So sometimes the loss function should not be the same as the evaluation function. Sometimes you need a trick. Uh, in the case of classification, we have three tricks. Today we will discuss the least squares loss. Uh, in two weeks we will discuss the log loss or the lo logistic regression, and then afterwards we will discuss the support vector machine loss or the hinge loss. Um, these last two ones are actually good and you should use. The first one is not good and you shouldn't use, but it's a good example of a loss function to finish on. So we at least have one way of doing classification before we move on. But practically it's not actually a good loss function. And basically what we do for the least squares loss is we take what we learned in the first uh, part of the lecture for regression and we repurpose it for classification. So we just take our uh, classification problem and we turn it into a regression problem by taking these class labels that we have, this column of classes, of trues and falses, and we just assign them numbers. So we assign one to all the blue points and we assign minus one to all the red points. And we just fit a line to that. We fit a line to that and we see where the uh, classification boundary ends up. And that turns out to be a pretty good classification boundary. In this case, obviously. So here's what the loss function then looks like. So you basically you sum over all your data points and you take the output of your model and you subtract the target point. So for the positive points, the target is one. So you subtract one. For the negative points, the target is minus one. So you subtract minus one, so you add one. So this is your loss function. And that gives you a classification boundary. And it gives us a smooth loss function that we can plot over this surface. So we are, we've gotten rid of all these jagged edges and these flat uh, parts of our model space. We have a nice smooth bowl in which we can search for a minimum using gradient descent. Uh, here's what that looks like in feature space. So as you can see, at least for this data set, this loss function works pretty well and separates all the points nicely. We can do this, play around with this in TensorFlow, uh, or the TensorFlow playground. I should mention that in uh, this app, it's not actually least squares loss. It's, it's one of these more advanced loss functions, probably log loss. Uh, but the principle is the same, so it's nice to have a look at it anyway. Um, so let's start with a very linearly separable data set, which you see here on the right. So we have blue points and orange points again, but now they are classes to initialize it to a point that doesn't already classify it properly. So we have blue points and orange points. These are now classes, and we have a classification boundary. So imagine this plane intersecting your feature space. And then we just do gradient descent, and we see that slowly the model finds a nice fit. Even though there's a little bit of noise, uh, the model still fits the data pretty well because they're roughly pretty linearly separable. If we go to a data set like this, there's no hope of fitting a line through this, obviously. So we see that gradient descent struggles a little bit. Or it doesn't even really move very much. I think it sort of ends up going all the way to the top. 
So it still it still has a sort of best effort thing here. Ah, oh, no, it just sort of yeah, it's a best effort. So it captures at least a couple of the orange points, uh, but it gets a lot of them wrong. Oh, it's changed its mind. It's going back. So it has some options, at least in this data set. But here we have the XOR data set, which is an important example historically. Basically, this uh, data set takes the sign of the two features. And if they're both positive, it gives it a positive class. It makes it blue. If they're both negative, it also makes it blue. If one of them is positive, the other is negative, it, makes, it colors it orange. So you get this sort of uh, four squares of uh, classification points, which means they're utterly not linearly separable. It's a very simple relation, but it's not linearly separable at all, which you can see that gradient descent really doesn't know what to do. And there it goes. <laughs> It just decides to call everything blue, so that at least it has a misclassification rate of 50%. Uh, so you might ask yourself, well, if only one in these four example data sets, there's actually a linear separation, why do we care so much about linear classifiers? <clears throat> one is that they're cheap. So if you have high dimensional data, like this, uh, these MNIST digits with these 700 pixels, then there's often quite a good linear separation. So the higher your dimensions, the more information you have about each feature, the more likely you are to find a linear separation. The second thing is that you can actually transform your features to make them linearly separable. So you can add dimension that, dimensions that are derived from the other dimensions. So if you have only a few dimensions and your data is not linearly separable, you can derive a bunch of other dimensions from those initial two dimensions and then make it linearly separable. So you can actually, with this linear classifier, still find linear separation. Uh, so we'll look at that next week. Uh, so basically, this li these linear models, even though they're not always very useful by themselves, they make a very good stepping stone to almost all the more complicated models that we're going to talk about in the course. And they allow us to explain this uh, lovely search method called gradient descent. So, summary of what we've talked about today. We've talked first about black box optimization methods, like random search simulated annealing uh, and evolution, evolutionary methods. These are simple to implement, and they work on discrete model spaces, and they work on basically any model for which you can evaluate your loss. So if you don't want to do a lot of programming and you want a simple method, these are very helpful methods. If you need something more powerful, you can look into your model and apply calculus, but it has to be continuous uh, and it has to be smooth. But then you can apply gradient descent. And then if you want to do it for classification rather than regression, you need to find a smooth loss function to replace misclassification rate, which doesn't work very well with calculus or with random search. Uh, and the first one we've looked at is least squares loss, but we're also going to lo look at log loss and hinge loss. And that's all I had for you today. Thank you for coming, and uh, I'll see you next Monday when we start talking about methodology of machine learning. <laughs>